Hello lords and ladies of the internet, I'm Ikea Kandor, and today we'll be talking about the history of kobolds in fantasy. Kobolds have a strange and complicated history, more than any other creature we've discussed in the history of fantasy series thus far. The basic idea for kobolds in history is that of a trickster spirit, with a small focus on crafting and notes of earthiness or underground. Kobolds and their myths start in prehistoric Greece with two things, the Kreklapas and the Cavieri. We will start with the Cavieri. These refer to a group of Catholic deities, which means of the earth, and yes, that is the word that inspired Lovecraft to make the word Cthulhu. These deities existed before Greece, and eventually were integrated into the Greek pantheon as children of Hephaestus and a sea nymph named Cavieri. This is where the crafting in kobolds comes from, and some of their more underground and fiery tones. Now on to the Krekopas. This name refers to a pair of thieves who once robbed Hercules. Hercules later caught them, and instead of killing them, he tied them up with their heads facing down. From here, three versions of this myth are written. He either gives them to the Lydian queen Omphile, who he was working for at the time, or Zeus curses them. The way Zeus curses them is he either turns them into stone or into monkeys. Side note. If you ever see online that kobolds once stole from Hercules, this is why. Now, the one I want to focus on is the myth where they're turned into monkeys. This helps explain why kobolds have such a weird tail and are sometimes furry in modern depictions. Also, the Krekopas are usually shown bound at the feet, hanging from a pole, like in this fresco here. They were also painted to have blue skin, but the paint has since faded. This puzzled me and several anthropologists until a connection was made to monkeys. Prehistoric Greeks had this place called Monkey Markets, where they sold monkeys such as this, the Blue Monkey. Looking at the Blue Monkey and its exotic fur color, we can now see why the ancient Krekopas were painted blue. Both of these concepts would evolve throughout the years until they were combined and codified further in ancient Greece, combined the words into a new one, Koboloi. From here, they became more spirit-like, joining the god Dionysus, where they gained the ability to shapeshift, but they also got another thing that's a little bit less PG. So this is where it gets weird, because in ancient Greece, the word for tail also forms their name. However, a human tail means a phallus. So all the koboli art in this era depicts this phallus. <laughs> it also explains why they got paired with Dionysus and you can imagine some of the antics these guys got into. From here, they basically stayed as spirits of trickery and slowly got introduced to the rest of Europe. When talking about Europe, several leading mythologists have reached the conclusion that their trickster house spirits originate from here. Some examples that you might be familiar with is the North English Boggart, the Scottish Boggle, the French Goblin, the Medieval Goblinus, the German Kobold, and the English Puck. I would also wager that the dwarves in North mythology and gnomes from German myths also originate from here, following their own logic. But, as I mentioned, we move from Greece with the koboloi to German with the kobold. Now we have the correct word. However, these kobolds are more like mind spirits, causing collapses and guiding miners to veins of ore. House kobolds also exist, and again, they cause minor mischief or boons depending if they're satisfied. In some versions of the myth, kobolds are spirits of the children who've died. This is true of Heinzelmann, the most famous kobold. He's said to dwell in Hodenhagen Castle and arrive there after being slain in the forests of Bohemia. There he gives gifts and trinkets to well-behaved children, and he helps the servants with their tasks as long as they leave appropriate gifts for him in return. If he was ever chased out, it's said that malicious actions would take place and bad luck would fill the castle. The castle has since been demolished, sadly. Now, kobolds basically exist as these hauntings and spirits with them being childlike, except more violent and hard to get rid of. In one tale, which I find amusing, a man has a kobold haunted barn, and he puts all of the straw into a cart and then burns the barn down, and sets off to start anew. As he rides away, he looks back and sees the kobold sitting right behind him. And the kobold says, It was high time we got out of there. I'm sick of that place. Going back to the mines, kobolds are all over mining myths. 
Every single mine has cobalt, and they can be heard tunneling and mining constantly. Cobalts keep their tricksy nature here too, leading miners to false minerals or worse, toxic ones. These toxic minerals would kill many a miner and collectively became called cobalt minerals, which was slowly shortened to cobalt. And now, modern cobalt takes its name from these toxic chemicals. There's also a small branch of sea cobalts, and these sea cobalts basically act the same, helping sailors or causing mischief. From here, cobalts have a very linear route. They're adapted into Dungeons and Dragons. In the first editions of D&D, they were known as simply being related to goblins and called dwarf-like, which I find very interesting looking at their history and where it turns into. There isn't a whole lot written about cobalts yet, with their features remaining mostly undescribed. The next big development is an article called Tucker's Cobalt, published in Dragon Magazine. Here, the cobalts became associated with traps. I'll link the article below, it is well worth a read. The main gist though is this dungeon master, Tucker from Fort Bragg, used his cobalts to torture the players. These cobalts didn't have any stat changes, they simply fought well, used clever tactics and traps to win. These cobalts wrecked a party of 6 to 12 level characters and killed all of their hired followers by using traps and well placed firing positions. This is where the scrappy nature and the vindictive maliciousness of cobalts come from. Plus their obvious love of traps. Second edition made them more distinct, looking like a mix between a rat and a monkey, plus adding in their intense hatred for gnomes, which is another nice callback. These cobalts also are described as having mangy and scaly hides, which is the first time we see scales applied to cobalts. This is also the big split in cobalts. From here, two branches occur in fantasy. The dog and rat-like cobalts, versus the lizard-like cobalts. Third edition D&D, as well as works looking towards it, kept the lizard-like features, with a draconic heritage being added in, or at least some relationship to dragons, like maybe worship. I think this was done to help keep cobalts more separate from the goblinoid races. You know, the bugbears, goblins, and hobgoblins. Being lizard-like also allowed cobalts to be attached to dragons, providing for an easy foe for low-level parties to kill that will lead up to a big dragon boss fight at the end. The second branch is where they are more dog-like, and this is based more on the second edition and first edition writings, with many stories that have dog humanoids simply calling them cobalts. I think the lizard cobalts are the most popular type, with many books and games including them. Now, the furry or more mammalian cobalts are less common, but every version I've seen has been unique. World of Warcraft and many Japanese works use these more dog-like creatures. The Japanese have really latched on to this, with some works having all of their dog-related humanoids being called kobolds. I also do want to make a shout out to World of Warcraft and the world of Azeroth. I appreciate them tying the kobolds succinctly into their mining culture, and the idea that they all wear candles on their head and the whole, you know, take candle is quite adorable, I think. Every kobold past this point seems to either call back to 3rd edition D&D with a dragon and lizard like kobolds, or 2nd edition with a dog or rat like kobolds. A notable change to kobolds I actually quite like is in Sword Art Online, where they look a lot more like kangaroos, and I just think kangaroos deserve more representation in fantasy. Before you ask, yes, I have kangaroos in Enos, don't worry. And speaking of Enos, my kobold tribes are in the draconic category, but they're much friendlier. Kobolds and Enos value two things, their tribes and meat. They are all carnivores and love eating meat, with each kobold having a different cut or flavor they like. On the tribes front, kobolds can make anything a tribe. Their family, a city, an adventuring band, all can be kobolds' tribes. They are very loyal to their tribes and will fiercely fight to defend them and also can act harshly to those outside or to anybody who would cause harm upon their tribes. This is my remix of them, and I think it works very well, because they're also player characters. That is all for today. Thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed the content, I'd appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. I'm looking forward to your candor in the comments below, and have a great day.